Well, good morning. It's nice to see you guys here this morning. And um, today we're talking about one thing that robs our joy and our peace is envy. And uh, why is it that when we see somebody who has something and we want it, and why is it that we want what they have? Or we go, oh, they don't deserve that. I mean, gosh, I work harder than them. I, why, why did they get some nice things and I don't get anything? We, as humans, we are prone to envy. We're prone to jealousy. And it starts early for people, right? You have, you have two two-year-olds in the backyard with two toys. And whatever the one two-year-old goes for, the other two-year-old, they run for the other one, right? No. They want what that other person has, right? So they go up after that other two-year-old, they're like, I want that! And they start fighting, right? Envy starts early. I remember envy starting really early in my life. And as I was preparing for this message, I got assigned this message on envy, and I went, I don't want to teach on that. I mean, that's like my Achilles tendon. It's like, it's like something that I deal with and I'm tempted with and I've given into that temptation and I, I've been so envious even my whole life. And I look back uh, as a kid. It's kind of funny watching that video clip because we lived in the smallest house in my neighborhood, okay? It was a one bedroom with a, with a add-on attic where us five kids grew up, right? Okay? We lived directly, our front doors directly looked at the biggest house in our town, huge house. It was a mansion. It was three stories. The guy had a billiard room on the third story. It was a whole story just for billiards, right? And they're packing us LSOG kids up in the attic, you know, right? And I want that billiard room, you know? He had this cool long driveway like in the movie stars, you know, like, you know, this cool long driveway that drove up and you could actually drive it into the bottom of the house, it was so cool. It's like James Bond kind of stuff. I want a garage like that. Our garage is kind of leaning over like this, you know, and we're like scared to go inside of it, right? I mean, I wanted it. I looked at the neighbors on either side of our house, and they were great neighbors, but they had boats. And they had a cabin on the lake, and I didn't have a boat. I wanted a boat. Can you imagine how the great injustice it is for me to grow up in Minnesota and never own a boat? I mean, come on. My neighbors next door had two phones. Okay, some of you are old enough to remember the day where everyone had one phone in their house, right? And those people, some had two phones, right? Because they could afford to pay AT&T through the nose for their extra phone, right? I wanted two phones. Kid behind me, he's got a Commodore 64, 64 bytes of memory, man. Unbelievable. I didn't have a computer. I didn't even have a calculator. Come on. And envy in my heart. So many things. And as I, as I became an adult, it didn't really end. Because as adults, we have this tendency to envy as well. And so I would, I'd be driving around my clunker and somebody would get a new car. And I couldn't afford a new car, so I'm driving around a clunker, and I look over at their car, and I'm like, wow, they don't even serve Jesus, and they're driving around this car, right? I mean, I gave up my life for Jesus, and I'm driving around this piece of junk. I had this one car that actually, I drove it home from work, and it, it was losing all its fluids all the time, so I'd, I was at work, and I was filling it up with oil and brake fluid and antifreeze and all this other stuff, and I'd forgot to put the cap on any of them. I closed the door. I drove to my fiance's house. It was her mom's house. I drove there. I pulled right up to the driveway. I get out. And I'm like, what is that? Flames are coming out from under the hood. So I run and I say, call 911, right? And my mother-in-law goes, why? Right? Why call 911? I'm like, the car's on fire. And she goes, where's it parked? I'm like, right by the garage. She goes, go move it. I'm not moving it. <laughs> Fortunately, the guys right across the street were firemen, and they actually came over with their fire extinguishers and just put it out. And I'm like, man, why don't I have the nice car? Why don't I always drive a piece of junk? Always. Somebody, somebody, I'm, you know, slaving away at work, and somebody comes up and goes, yeah, I'm going on this great vacation, man. And it was all free. 
I'm going to this exotic place. It's all free. It's all paid for. I'm like, I'm on my staycation at Seven Peaks. You know? (laughs) This is not fair. Envy and jealousy. Thought, and here's the thing I came up with, that thoughts of envy and jealousy and looking at what someone else wants, it has never once brought peace to my heart. Never once do those thoughts ever, have they ever brought peace to my heart, not brought peace to my life. So today we're continuing our series on peace. And I have this place in my mind where peace is, right? In my mind, I'm sitting on this grassy hill right? And just below me is this lake. It's probably stocked with fish. Of course, my boat is hooked right up to the dock there, right? My beautiful boat. It's really not much nicer than my neighbor's boat. And I'm just sitting there and there's a little breeze going and the sun is shining, but it's not hot and I have no responsibility in the world. And I'm just sitting there. Oh, that's my place of peace, right? That's my peaceful place. That's my happy place, right? But I don't always find myself in a place in my life where I have peace. And the peace that we seek oftentimes ends up being destroyed by what's going on inside of us. We find ourselves striving for something greater. We find ourselves seeking after material possessions. And when we get them, we're going, ah, look what I got. And then we look over here, and the guy next to us, He's got one too, only it's bigger, it's shinier, it's prettier, it's faster. You're going, well, look at this crap that I have. Look at what he's got. I want that. I want that. And what about relationships? Mr. Every every guy is looking for Mrs. Wright, you know? He's looking for Mrs. Wright. And he, he finally finds Mrs. Wright. She's good looking. She's slender. She's fun. She's all this, you know, and she's all great. She's wild and crazy. And he's like, I want to marry that girl. So he marries that girl and they have a great time, right? And then all of a sudden, after a couple kids, she gains a little weight. She starts maxing out all the credit cards, buying shoes, right? And he starts looking at her and and she's no longer interested in you know what. And, and he's going, this is not the gal I married. What's going on? They start getting into fights about money and fights about this and fights about the kids and all this stuff. And pretty soon he's going, this ain't Mrs. Wright. And all of a sudden a, a neighbor or a coworker or, a, or, or even someone at church looks more appealing. And says, ah, that's what I want. I want that. And envy sets in the heart. It happens with every single one of us that that we look at what we can't have or what God has not given us and we say, I want that. That's what I want. So why don't we have peace? Why don't we want the things? Why do we want the things that we don't have? Why do we feel that we're entitled to have things that others have? Why do we get angrier or bitter? when we see somebody who has something that we can't or don't have. God's word says a lot about envy. We're going to look at some of that today. And we've been been teaching through this book of James for the last few weeks. And I'm telling you, James, I call call James the kick-butt book of the Bible. Because if you want your spiritual butt kicked, read James, okay? Now, when I'm feeling away from God, and, and I really don't want him to talk to me. And there's times in my life that that's the way it is. I'm like, eh, I don't, right? I don't read the book of James. I know to stay away from it, because I know it's going to straighten me out, right? But when I say, man, God, I want to I come closer to you. I, I'm feeling distant from you. I really, need, I really need to get my life back on track. I go to the book of James, and it straightens me out. Right from the get-go. James is a straight shooter. He's, he's a guy that says it like it is. And he's a guy who's really, really concerned about the church. He was one of Jesus' followers. He was one of Jesus' brothers. He becomes a follower of Jesus. And he sees the church. And he sees that even in the church, among people who are following God, he sees that they're all full of envy and bitterness and 
selfish ambition, he goes, oh man, no, 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 no. Let me, let me show you where peace really comes from. It comes from God's wisdom. But before uh, we take a look at James, let's just look at a few verses on God's wisdom for us about envy. And you can write these down if you want in your, in your um, programs. But Proverbs 14.30 says this, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Isn't that a great picture word? Right? Isn't that a great picture? Here's a picture of a heart filled with peace gives life to the body. For some of you who know your Bibles well, and we say this verse a lot here, Jesus said, I have come to give you what? Life and life to the full. And what do we call Jesus? Jesus is the Prince of Peace, right? So here's the deal. A thousand years before Jesus was even, had even come to earth, right? Solomon writes this. He knows this. This is God's wisdom. He writes this in this book of Proverbs. It's just filled with God's wisdom. He says, a heart at peace brings life to the body, but envy rots the bones. It's serious stuff. Proverbs 23, go a few more chapters back, and it says, do not let your heart envy sinners. But always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Don't look at that guy who's like, that guy doesn't even serve God. And look at all the stuff he has. He has buildings and he has businesses and he drives in a limo and he does all this stuff. Solomon says, don't envy that guy. I'm telling you. Because he may gain the world. He's going to lose his soul. Don't envy somebody like that. Envy after God. Go after what God wants. Job chapter 5 verse 2 says, Resentment kills a fool, and envy slays the simple. Envy is a killer. And that's the reason why James is addressing this today. And there's just one more verse that is the opposite of envy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you'll hear this passage read at weddings all the time if you go to weddings in the summer. Verse 4 of chapter 13 says, Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Thoughts of envy do not come from love. They do not come from God's wisdom. They do not come from up above. And here's where they do come from. Let's take a look at James chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles, you can look. If you want to look up here on the screen. James chapter 3, starting with verse 13. Here's what he says. Who is wise among you? Let him show it by his good life and by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So here's, here's the, how he starts off. He says, who's wise among you? If you're really wise, show it. How? By your good deeds. Show it by your humility. Show it by your godliness. Show it by what Christ has done in your life. Who's wise? That's the wise man right? And then he goes on in verse 14. Here's the warning. Here's the, here's, here's where James really kicks it in. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny it. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly. It's unspiritual. It's of the devil. Wow. That's pretty strong language, huh? Envy is of the the devil. For where you find envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. Wow. How harmful is envy? Well, you think about it. It's listed as one of the seven deadly sins, right? Seven deadly sins. Not the seven almost deadly sins, but they're the seven deadly sins, okay? It's in that list. And then throughout the, throughout the New Testament, especially in the, in the writings of, um, of Paul and some of the teachings of Jesus, they'll list these sins. They'll say, these are sins that are going to keep you from God. They're going to keep you out of God's kingdom. They're going to keep you out of relationship with God. And here are some of them. And then they list off all these sins, right? And they list off things like witchcraft, right? That's kind of creepy, right? Witchcraft is creepy. Yeah, that'll probably keep you from God. Witchcraft. Murder. Oh, yeah. People who kill people. Yeah, of course, they're... They're far away from God, right? Yeah. Adultery. 
cheating on your spouse, adultery. That's, that's in the list. That's pretty bad. That causes all kinds of bad things to happen, right? But in every one of these lists where all these really bad things are listed, every time, you know what else is listed in there? Jealousy and envy. And in those lists, it says, these are things that are going to keep you out of relationship with God, even if you can't see it. If you're, some of you may be familiar with the Bible, and you might know it very well. Some of you might, might be in here, and you're not really familiar with the Bible, and to you, it's just kind of this big book that's overwhelming. But the Bible is just a collection, really, of stories of people, real people, who lived in real places, who had experiences with a real God. But here's the thing. So many people think, oh, those Bible characters, they're so holy and they're, they're the saints, right? No, man, they were messed up. Every single one of them was messed up. Just like us. They were messed up. And as, as Mike Rutledge and I, we were preparing this, this message together, it was kind of fun. And as we were kind of recounting from the beginning of the Bible through all these different Bible characters and stories, the number one thing that tripped them up and caused destruction and brought God's wrath all came out of one thing, envy. Envy. And it starts here. Here's where it starts. Satan. His name was Lucifer. Did you know that Satan wasn't always evil? Did you know that? God created all these angels, and one of them was Lucifer, and he's one of the chief angels, man. God gave him a high position in heaven. And Lucifer looked at God. He said, who does he think he is, being God and all? I mean, I'm pretty cool. Maybe I should be God. Maybe everyone should worship me. And so he started to... He actually started a rebellion against God among the angels, believe it or not. He started this rebellion against God and the angels, and he said, I will exalt myself above God. But God, being God, said, no, you won't. I'm God. And he threw Satan down to the earth. And he became this force of evil this, that, that brought evil into the world. And so as we look at the very beginning of the Bible, you have... Two people, the first two people, their names were Adam and Eve, right? They're there, they're in the Garden of Eden. And Satan comes and he says, oh, I'm going to tempt Adam and Eve. What is the best way to get these guys, right? So he comes to Eve and he says, hey, you know, I, I noticed that God set up this tree of knowledge of good and evil and he won't let you eat of it. You know, you know what God is really trying to do, Eve? He's trying to keep you from knowing what he knows. That's right. He's trying to keep stuff from you. Do you know if you eat of that, he knows that you'll know stuff that he knows. And you'll be just like God. So what did Eve do? What entered her heart? Envy. She now envied what God had. She envied his knowledge. She envied his position. The same envy that, that Lucifer had in heaven, now he was implanting in Eve's heart. And she gives into it and she eats it, right? And her eyes are open, just like he said. Yeah, her eyes are open. And she got to watch her paradise go away. And she got to watch her life get hard. And she lost her relationship with God. Envy all starts there. And it didn't stop there, right? Uh, does anyone remember Adam and Eve's kids, their names? Cain and Abel, right? It, you read there, right in the next chapter, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel go out to offer a sacrifice to God, right? And Abel comes with this pure heart, and he offers a sacrifice to God. And Cain kind of comes begrudgingly to, before God. And he's like, ah, another sacrifice, Blah, whatever, right? And he throws out his sacrifice, and God doesn't accept it. I don't know how that happened or whatever, but God does not accept Cain's sacrifice. He accepts Abel's. And Cain looks at his brother Abel. Instead of, instead of saying, oh, I'm so glad you have God's favor on your life. He's like, I want that favor. Why would God treat me like this? And he'd treat my brother so good. So he goes out and confronts his brother. He ends up striking his brother and actually kills his very own brother. Why? Because envy entered his heart. 
What did he lose? He lost his relationship with his parents. He lost his relationship with God. He was banished. He was marked as a murderer for the rest of his life. Go a little farther into Scripture. And who do you see? You see Jacob and Esau. These two brothers, Esau, they're, they're twins, but Esau came out of the birth canal first, so he was the firstborn. So he got the birthright. He got the inheritance. And Jacob looks at him and he's like, I deserve that. I'm God's chosen one. And so envy enters his heart. So he ends up tricking his brother out of his birthright. He ends up tricking his father into giving him the inheritance. He's lying to his parents. He's lying to his father. He's lying to his brother. He steals from his brother out of envy. And what happens to him? He's a fugitive for the next 14 years. He's running away from Esau. He loses everything he had right there. And here's the interesting part, because God redeems this. Every time, God ends up redeeming out of envy, but envy enters the heart. And now Jacob and Esau, Jacob had this envy, and now Jacob has 12 sons. And uh, out of his 12 sons, he picks a favorite. His name is Joseph, right? who becomes the character for Joseph in the Technicolor Dream Code, if you've ever heard of that. But he actually, it's right, it comes right out of the book of Genesis, okay? He says, it says that Joseph, or Jacob made this beautiful coat for Joseph. And all his brothers saw him. He'd walk around with this coat on, and his brothers were, their hearts, it says their hearts were filled with envy, right? They're like, who does he think he is, Right? Who does that Joseph think he is? So the first time they get an opportunity, they're out kind of far away from home and Joseph shows up on the scene and his brothers grab him. They throw him in a pit. They take his coat and they rip it apart and they pour animal's blood on it and they sell their brother into slavery and he ends up going to Egypt into slavery and into prison, their very own brother, for doing nothing because of the envy in their heart. And what's the end result of that? They take that coat to their father How do you think he feels? Breaks their father's heart. And he actually says, I will go down to the grave with Joseph. And for the rest of his life, he lived in mourning for a son. That's what envy does. It goes on and on and on through generations. And later in the history of Israel, God was their king, right? God is their king. They worship God and God provided everything for them and he provided leaders for them and we call them judges and they were judges that ruled over the people and here's Israel and they start looking around at the other nations and they go, hey, those guys got kings. We don't have a king. They did have a king. It was God. We don't have kings. We want a king like the other nations. Give us a king. So God gives them a king. God's heart is broken. He's like, they've rejected me as king. I'll give them a king. And so they choose a guy. They choose a guy named Saul. And they choose Saul because Saul's a head taller than everybody else. He's a big guy. He's a strong guy. He's a very good looking man. They said, ah, we want the nations to see that and let them see our king, right? The only problem is Saul's heart was a bad heart. So here's where the story picks up. And this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So Saul, picture this. Saul is over here and there's kind of this valley between them. And Saul's over here and he's got all of his soldiers, right? He's got all of his soldiers and and they're lined up, and it's the army of the Lord. That's what they're called, the army of the Lord, the nation of Israel. And over here on the other side is a group of guys called the Philistines, right? You know, and they were just rough and tough, and they hated God, and, and they didn't like Israel at all. And they had this chief warrior called Goliath. And Goliath comes out every morning. He's like taller than Shaquille O'Neal. The guy's got this huge spear and this huge sword. He's got this deep voice, and he comes out every morning and he says, All right, Israel, let's not go to war. Just send out one of your warriors and fight me. And if you win, we will become your servants. But if I win, you'll become our servants. And so he'd come out and he would curse God and he would curse Israel. He'd say, you guys are a bunch of wimps. And every time, you know what they would do? Every time Goliath came out, they'd turn their tail and run. They would run, shaking in their boots, including... Their king, 
Saul, who's supposed to be this mighty warrior. In Saul's army, there were seven brothers. And these were the brothers, uh, these were the sons of Jesse. And Jesse uh, was their father, and he had eight sons actually, but only seven of them served in the army. And they were there with Saul, and they were scared too. And so Jesse one day says, hey, to the eighth son, the youngest, he's about this tall. He's, he's a shepherd boy. His name is David. He goes out, he sits in the field with the sheep and plays his harp all day. You know? Yeah. You know? And so this is, this is David, right? David's got this heart after God, and he, actually the songs that he writes are, are psalms, and they're actually in our Bibles today. He says, David, David, take some provisions to your brothers, Okay? Take some, take some cheese, take some, take some wheat, take some provisions, take some to your brothers and take some to King Saul so they'll be, they'll be ready for battle. So David takes all these provisions out to, to the battlefield and he gives them to his brothers and he gives them to Saul. And as he's, as he's hanging out with his brothers, all of a sudden he hears Goliath come out, right? Comes out for his daily taunt. Hey, you guys! And he does, says the same thing over and over. And he curses God and he curses Israel. And David's just standing there. And he's looking at this guy. He's going, what? And then he goes to ask somebody, what is the deal with this guy? He turns around, and they're all gone. They're all behind the hill somewhere, hiding behind a rock somewhere. He's like, what? What? And so he goes back to his buddies. He goes back to some of the soldiers. He goes, I can't believe this guy. He's cursing God. He's cursing our family. He's cursing our ancestors. He's cursing us. I can't believe... What would be done for a guy who would would knock that guy off? And they're like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, who's going to fight that guy, huh? Right? And David goes, oh, yeah. What would be done for a guy who who would take that guy on? And I was like, well, the king said he'd give give one of the princesses, one of his daughters in marriage to any guy who who would kill Goliath. David goes, oh, yeah, right I'm going to do that. They're like, what? His, one of his brothers overhears this conversation. He starts ripping into David. What do you think you are, you little punk? Who do you think you are? I know you. you got all this pride in your heart. You think you're great. Why don't you go home to the sheep? It's all you're good for anyway. David just ignores his brother. That's like, it's so cool. He just ignores him and walks away. He goes into Saul and he says, Saul, I can't believe what that guy said. He goes, I, I want to go after him. I want to fight him. Saul just sits there and he laughs. Come on. You're just a little shepherd boy. A little harp. What are you going to do? And David says, oh, I'm telling you, I watch sheep. And when I watch sheep one day, a lion came and took one of my sheep and I went after that lion. I killed him with my bare hands. Saul's like, whoa. He goes, yeah, and that happened with a, with a, with a bear too. He says, I killed a bear. I killed a lion with my bare hands. I can certainly take on this guy. And Saul's like, all right, ain't no stopping this guy. She's like, well, we're going to have to protect you, get you some weapons. Because this guy, he's been training since he was a kid. So Saul takes his armor. And you can imagine, Saul probably was like, I don't I guess he was taller than me. And David was probably this tall. And he starts putting all this heavy armor on him. And David's like, You know, I can't walk. I can't breathe. David's like, this is not going to work. So he pulls off all of Saul's armor. He goes down, and, and the shepherds at the time had these slings. They were just a rope with a little leather pocket. And they put a rope, uh, rock in there, and they'd wind them up, and they'd, you know, use it to propel a rock to, to ward off, you know, lions or bears or anything else that wanted to attack their sheep. So here it is. Next morning... Goliath comes out with his taunt, right? Hey, you guys! Obviously, you know, we're on like day 40 and nobody's coming out to fight me, you know? And all of a sudden, David pops up and it says he ran towards Goliath. (laughs) Right? He gets there. And Goliath looks at him and he goes, Who does this guy think he is? You think I'm a dog? Did you send out a boy with sticks to fight me? And David said, oh, he points at Goliath. He says, you come with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And today you're going down, Goliath. 
And Goliath is just laughing. What are you going to do, you know? Bite me? You know? Seriously, what's he going to do? And all of a sudden, David pulls out that sling. Right? He puts the rock in it. And he lets go. Bam, right in Goliath's forehead. Goliath falls to the ground. Bam! David runs right up to Goliath. He's got no weapon. He goes up, he pulls out Goliath's sword. And he kills Goliath, and then he cuts off his head. <laughs> nice picture, huh? He cuts off his head. He grabs his head, and he goes, Yeah! Yeah! Right? And all of a sudden, all the, na- the armies of Israel, they get this courage in their heart, like, Wow! Yeah, we can beat these guys! Right? So they start running across the battlefield. And the Philistines, they're looking and they're going, that guy's holding, that little kid's holding Goliath's head. We got to get out of here. So they run the other direction. And, and And the armies of Israel go after and they actually defeat the Philistines and drive them out of the nation. Right? So here's what happens. So what happens next? Saul says in his heart, he's like, well, we've defeated the Philistines. After all this time of them taunting us, we've defeated them. So Saul kind of gets on his high horse. He probably actually gets on a horse, right? He gets on a high horse. He starts riding around going, hey, ain't I the big cheese, right? I'm the king, and I have just defeated the Philistines. And he's riding around. And here's what happens. The women from all the towns come out. It says the women from all of Israel come out, and they start singing a song. This is found in, you can read it in 1 Samuel chapter 18. They come out re- singing the song and they sing, Saul has killed his thousands. And he's like, yeah, baby, you know I have. I'm the roughest, toughest guy in town, right? And so he's like this. And then all of a sudden they sing the second verse. And David has killed his ten thousands. And he goes, what? He killed one guy. He killed one guy, he killed, he killed, he killed Goliath. What, what about me? And it says, it uses the word here, it says that the song, the refrain of the song just galled him, right? Have you ever been galled, right? Just like, ugh, you got this, this ugly feeling inside of you. Man, it galled him. So here's, here's, um, here's what it says. I got to read this to you because it was amazing to me. So, so David, from the time of, of uh, killing Goliath to the time that Saul went out on this victory lap for, the, for a few days or weeks, David had come to Saul and he'd been playing his harp for Saul and, and it made Saul feel good, right? So Saul gets back from his little, his little ride of victory, which turns into the ride of defeat. He goes back and he sits in his tent and he calls David in to worship God with him, Right? So David comes in with his pure heart. He comes in, he's like, let me sing you a worship song. He starts strumming his, his, his harp. And Saul reaches and he grabs his javelin. <laughs> Throws it right at David. Bam! Misses him. David runs. <laughs> runs. But listen to this. You want to know what envy does? Get this. Saul was very angry. Verse 8 of 18, Saul was very angry. They have credited David with 10,000s and he thought, and it's interesting that he said, it, he thought, he didn't say this, he only thought this. And they have only credited me with thousands. What can keep David from getting my kingdom? And verse 9 says, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. He kept a jealous eye on him. It blows my mind. Saul's the king. He's got a crown. He's got everything in the kingdom at his disposal. He has the respect. He has the throne. And who's he jealous of? A little punk who's got a couple sheep. And that's who he's jealous of? He thinks, that guy's going to steal my throne. I can't have that. And he tries over and over and over again to kill David. And for years and decades, Saul's main objective is to kill David. 
That's what burned in his heart. But get this. How dangerous is envy and jealousy? Remember verse 9, it says, From that day on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Verse 10 says, The very next day, an evil spirit came forcibly upon Saul. Wow. That hit me when I read that. That's like the saddest verse in the Bible to me. This man who was king of the armies of Israel, the armies of God, gave in to this envy. And the only thought is, he only had a thought. And what did it do? All of a sudden, this evil, this force of evil, this evil spirit came upon him in a forcible way. Wow. That's the saddest thing. He should have been celebrating the fact that we have this new, this new warrior. He should have been celebrating the fact that, that we have this, this new guy, David, who just shows up on the scene and brings peace to the land. He brought peace to the land. And what does Saul do? He wants to kill him. He ends up promoting him to be a general so that he ho- in hopes that the enemies will kill David and get rid of him. The guy just went down hill so fast. But it's not just these Bible characters that, are, that were filled with envy and, and derailed their lives. It's every one of us. Because here's the deal. Satan knows. And some of you may think, ah, eh, Satan's not real. You know, he's not... A, I'm telling you, that's not a biblical worldview. Biblical worldview, what the Bible says is that he is real. And he is evil. And he's out to kill and steal and destroy every person on this planet. He does not want you to have life. He does not want you to have Christ. He does not want you to have God. And here's the deal. He knows. He knows that if you have envy in your heart, if he can plant envy in your heart, all kinds of evil and destruction will come upon you and everyone around you. I know God gave us 10 commandments. Does anyone remember that? You remember in the Bible where Charlton Heston goes up on the hill? You remember that? (laughs) All right, it was Moses, but Charlton Heston played him on the movie. Anyways, just just so you know, it wasn't Charlton Heston. It wasn't out in the Bible. He's not that old. He was old, but he's not that old. Okay, Moses goes up to receive the Ten Commandments, right? And commandment number 10, does anyone remember what commandment number 10 is? You shall not covet, right? Now they're stealing and adultery and idolatry and all this stuff. But you shall not covet. And let's look at this. It's it's recorded in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his donkey. Or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now if we're going to put this in modern English, you know, most people don't have oxen and donkeys. Some people do, but most of your neighbors don't, fortunately for you. But they do have cars and they do have things and they do have material possessions. And back in those days, those were the material possessions. And God's saying here, his big warning is, don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, not his house, not his wife, not his employees, not his business, not what he drives, nothing, nothing, Don't do it. It's wrong. And here's the thing about coveting or jealousy or envy. They're kind of all pretty much the same thing. Here's the deal. It's the only sin out of the Ten Commandments. It's the only one listed that has zero evidence that you cannot see. I mean, if someone bows down to idols, right? You see that They've broken one of the Ten Commandments. Don't have any other gods before me, right? You can actually witness it. If someone lies, you can catch them in their lie. You can prove that they lied, right? If someone steals and you find the stolen merchandise on them, you see that they steal. There's evidence of every single one of the nine Ten Commandments. But when you get to Commandment number 10, do not covet, you can covet with your eyes and with your heart and nobody will ever see it, ever. No evidence at all. You can get away with it for weeks, months, years, or decades. But remember what he says in James. He says, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. It always leads to a secondary sin. Always. 
I, uh, I brought a little prop here. Let me grab this here. This is a grenade. It's not a great grenade. It's not even a real grenade. It's a great grenade water balloon that I bought at Walmart. But anyways, <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to bring this out as, as just an example of, of what I'm talking about here. You know, soldiers use grenades in, in wartime. It's a mini bomb, right? And if a grenade is sitting there on the table, right? It's sitting there on a table. It's sitting there in a crate. It's sitting there on the box. It's, it's clipped onto their belts. Does it do anything? No. Nothing. It's just a grenade. It's just sitting there, right? But what is it filled with? It's filled with all kinds of explosives, right? And, and what is a grenade used for? Man, you throw it. It blows stuff up, right? You throw it. I'm not going to throw it at you. Okay. Just don't duck. Okay. You've all seen the wartime movies, or maybe some of you have actually been in the military and used a grenade or seen the power of a grenade, right? And we, and we see the, and if you watch a, a, a war movie or something, you see someone throw a grenade, what happens? Where it hits, poof, limbs are blown off, walls broken down, you know, poof, it contain, it causes all kinds of disaster all around it. And that's what envy's like. Envy's like this. It's in our heart. And it sits in there. And yeah, we think, nah, eh, it's not, you know, I have these thoughts and I have, I'm thinking about, you know, but nobody ever knows and I'm never going to act on those thoughts anyway, right? And, but envy's just sitting there in our hearts. Whatever it is, right? But someday, it will come out. Someday envy will find its way out. And that's what, exactly what James says. It will come out and when it comes out, it's going to land right in the middle of everybody who loves you. And it's going to blow them to pieces. And you're going to go, oh, why? Why did I do that? And people are, are going to be destruction and, and people laid waste and people destroyed because envy is like that. So what can be done? How do we stop this force of envy? that wants to destroy us and derail our lives. How can we get peace? How can we get peace? The great thing is there's a remedy for envy in the book of James. We don't have to stop there. We don't have to, we don't have to go, oh, feel bad about envy, right? No, that's not what he's saying here. He says, that's what will happen, but there is a remedy to envy. And here's what it is. It's in verse 17 of chapter 3. Here we go. You ready for this? It says, but wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving. It's considerate, submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Wow. That's a great promise right there. So man, if you're dealing with envy and you don't have peace in your heart, memorize this. Two short little verses. Memorize every part of that. Put it into action. So i got eight quick things that you can write these down, and I challenge you. If, if, if envy is something you're dealing with, or something your spouse is dealing with, of course, you're thinking about that, but no. Uh, you can give this to your spouse. No, this is for you, okay? If you're dealing with it, I just elaborated a little bit on... on on the words of James here, and here is the remedy for envy. If you want peace, do this. I'm going to put them on the screen here, and then we'll just take a look at this. Number one, think a pure, when envy comes into your heart, think a pure thought. Okay? Think a pure thought. Think of good things instead of thinking of, ugh, I can't believe he's got that and I don't. Right? Number two, think a peaceful thought. Think a thought of peace. Go to your happy place if you have to, right? Think of something peaceful in your life. Number three, be considerate to the person you are envious of. Seriously, if you got a raise and you told your friend, wouldn't you want them to be happy about that? Wouldn't you actually want them to be considerate and go, wow, that's so awesome, man. Do that in your heart. Be considerate of the person who has what you don't have. Number four, be submissive to God's thoughts. Get into God's word every day. Read his word. If you don't know where to start, just 
Open up the scriptures that you hear on, here on Sunday morning at K2 the church, right? Or get involved in a small group. Get into God's word every day. When we're submissive to God's thoughts, it gets rid of those thoughts that aren't from God. Here's another one. Number five. He says, be full of mercy. So show mercy to someone. Here's a real practical way to do this. You know, we do look at other people and go, wow, they have something greater than me. You know what that really does? That's a real insult to God. It really is. It's an insult to God. It says, God, you gave me crap. You gave them God's stuff. You gave me crap. That's what it is. It's an insult to God. But you know what? Here's the deal. So there's somebody right now that might be looking at your stuff, right? That, that you think isn't as great as you think it is. They might be looking at you and going, oh, I'd want that stuff. I want that. Yeah, you may be driving a clunker, but when I lost my job, I, I lost my car. Now I can't go to job interviews, right? Be merciful to somebody. Show compassion on somebody who has less than you. And all of a sudden, you'll start forgetting about wanting more for yourself. Number six, do something good. All right? It's full of mercy and good fruit. He says, do something good, right? We have lots of opportunities here to do good in our compassion ministries. Do something good. Because remember way at the beginning what, what James wrote? He says, how, how does someone show that they have wisdom? By their good deeds and their humility. That's how you show that you have the wisdom of God in you. Number seven, don't take sides, right? Wisdom from God, it's, it's impartial. So don't take sides, right? When somebody comes up and goes, yeah, did you see what he got? Did you see that boat? I, I don't know what he did. He must have taken out a second mortgage on his house to get a boat like that, right?